Good afternoon, hello, and uh, welcome to this session, uh, the Value Gap Round 2, a, a, another uh, panel digging into the uh, continuing contentious issue around Safe Harbor and the Value Gap. I can almost see you. Put your hands up if you um, sat in on the discussion about Safe Harbor and Value Gap that took place yesterday. Okay. A few of you. So we, we are endeavoring to uh, go off in, in different directions with this conversation. We will repeat a, a few of the basics at the start, but there will be some different things going on here as well. Um, I should introduce myself. So, um, oh, there we go. Am I going to get my slides up? There we go. Oh, now I've gone backwards. Okay. So, here's me. This is me. My name is chriscook.com. That is my website. That is where you can check me out online. And I am the MD and business editor of completemusicupdate.com. That is our website. That is where you can check us out online. Uh, and we call ourselves a service provider to the music industry. So we provide various different services to music companies and people who work in music. So we provide new services like our free CMU Daily Bulletin, our weekly CMU podcast. We provide seminars and masterclasses in London for music professionals. We do training in-house at music companies. Um, and we also run an education program for sort of aspiring artists and future industry talent called CMU DIY. So that's what CMU does. I run CMU, I write for CMU, I consult and I teach about the music industry. And through all of that, I spend, I would say, approximately 34% of my life trying to make complicated copyright law easy to understand. Um, because if you write songs, if you make recordings, if you work with people who write songs, or you work with people who make recordings, you are in the copyright business. So you need to understand how the different copyright systems around the world work. So I spend a lot of my time trying to help artists and songwriters and people who work at labels and publishers and across the music industry understand the complexities of, of copyright law. And I think the safe harbor and value gap has been one of the big controversies almost within the music copyright world for, for a while now, a year, probably two years, probably three years that this has been a big conversation within the music business press and at conferences like this. And so before I get my uh, panel up on stage to discuss some of those issues, to discuss where we're at here in 2017 and where we see the next steps on this debate, I just wanted to give you a very quick introduction to what it is that the safe harbor is and what is the music industry's problem with the safe harbor. So that uh, some of you in the room will already know this, but I sometimes think when you come to events like this, people talk a lot about copyright issues and not necessarily really everybody in the room completely knows what we're banging on about. So in eight minutes, I'm going to explain to you what the safe harbor is and why the music industry has a problem with the safe harbor as it is currently operated. And then I will introduce the bit of the European legislation which may or may not address that issue. Okay, and then once I've done that in eight minutes, I'll then get my panel up and we'll start the debate. Does that all make sense? Is that all following me so far? Okay, so very quickly, when we're looking at the safe harbor, in essence, we are beginning with copyright infringement. Okay? We're starting with the good old-fashioned world of copyright infringement. And imagine this happens. You have a random person who is connected to the internet, and they decide to distribute, without license, a piece of content to the wider world. Okay, so that may be a song, it may be a recording, it could be any piece of content. So a random person connects to internet, shares a, a piece of content with the world. That's copyright infringement. If you distribute content without license, that's copyright infringement. And what the law says is you should sue the copyright infringer. That, that's the remedy under law. You find the infringer and you sue them. Okay, so that's copyright infringement. However, for that random person to distribute this content on the internet, they need the services of an intermediary, a company or companies who help them distribute, communicate, make available that piece of content. It may be an ISP, a hoster company, a digital locker, social media, or a user upload platform. And if you're a copyright owner, you might look at those people and say, well, they are involved in the infringement. They are helping with the distribution of content without license. They are part of the infringement. They are facilitating the infringement. Why can't we sue them? It would be much easier to sue the intermediaries because they're easier to find and they've got money, whereas the random person is hard to find and probably doesn't have any money, and there's no point suing poor people. However, 
you can't sue the intermediaries in this scenario because of this thing called safe harbor. So what the safe harbor says, and you will find it in copyright systems around the world. In the US, it sits in the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Here in Europe, it is part of an e-commerce directive from the EU. And the safe harbor basically says that these intermediaries cannot be held liable for the copyright infringement of their users. The safe harbor originated in the 1990s, and when internet usage first started to go mainstream, mainly because of the World Wide Web and as email became a more normal way of, of communicating, as the internet was going mainstream, internet service providers, hosting companies, companies who provided internet services, said to lawmakers, we want to make the internet available to all. But if we do that, and then the people we sell services to use our networks and our servers to infringe copyright, if we can be held liable for that copyright, then this is the infringement, then this isn't going to work. Because if we can be held liable for our users' infringement, that will be such a big risk, we can't open the internet to the world at large. And so these safe harbors are inserted into law, which basically said you can't sue the intermediaries with one important proviso which is that the intermediary has to offer a system by which a rights owner can come to them and say, this bit of content is being distributed via your platform without license, that's copyright infringement, remove the content. And providing the intermediary provides that takedown system, then they have the safe harbor protection, and therefore they can't be sued for copyright infringement. Now. It has to be said that on one level, the safe harbor is quite sensible. And, and the music industry isn't objecting to the safe harbor in principle. It isn't saying that the safe harbor should be removed from law. What the music industry is predominantly objecting to is the breadth of services which are protected by this safe harbor. Um, and in particular, services like the user upload platforms, like YouTube, that... Well, the music industry would correctly argue that when lawmakers in the US and in Europe were adding the safe harbor into law in the 1990s, they never envisaged platforms like a YouTube from having safe harbor protection, mainly because they never envisaged platforms like YouTube even existing. Um, and so what the music industry is saying is, okay, the safe harbor is fine, but it is being applied to too wide a range of services. And the record companies and the publishers and the distributors and the collecting societies and the wider music community have most problem with the safe harbor, where you have a platform, like a user upload platform like YouTube, that is in competition with the streaming services, like Spotify and Apple Music and Deezer. And basically what they're saying here is, this company is an intermediary, but because of the services they're offering and the infringement they are facilitating but not liable for, they are able to compete with a Spotify, an Apple, and a Deezer. Now, what do we do about that? Well, one proposal is that we limit the safe harbor. We limit the kinds of services that have the safe harbor protection. We say that certain user upload platforms, not by name, but by type, do not have the safe harbor protection, which would then mean that ultimately you could sue the intermediary if they are facilitating copyright infringement. Now, it should be said that nobody wants to sue YouTube. Really, this is all about negotiating power. Safe Harbor reduces the negotiating power when copyright owners are negotiating licensing deals with user upload platforms like YouTube. And that's really what it's about. It's not that we want to, like, it's not that we want to sue YouTube. We want to license YouTube. I say we, that's the music industry. Um, but the negotiating power of the rights owners is weakened because of Safe Harbor. So very quickly, let me explain what I mean. When you're licensing a streaming service, you have the licensee there, OK? And they do a deal with the record companies, the distributors, the publishers, the collecting societies. And as a result of those deals, they get the content. They need the content to be in business. And crucially, no deal, no content. Okay? And therein lies the negotiating power of the music industry. The record companies, the publishers, the artists, the songwriters, they want streaming services. They want platforms where they can get their music out there and generate revenue. So they have an incentive to make these deals work. But they have negotiating power because no deal, no content. Now let's have a think about how we license a user upload platform. A user upload platform comes to the music industry already with the content because its users have uploaded it, and it tries to do a deal. If a deal can't be reached, what happens is that the rights owners can't say no content. They have to then request that all of their content be removed off the platform. Now the platform may provide something like Content ID to help with that process, but it's quite an onerous 
con uh, process, not least because the content keeps coming back. And so you have to keep doing it again and again and again as the content keeps getting re-uploaded. And so because of that, there's an incentive for the rights owners to say, oh, well, screw it, we'll do a deal, even though we're not happy with the deal. Which I suppose brings us to the value gap campaign. The music industry argument is this. User upload platforms exploit the safe harbor to strengthen their negotiating hand in order to get a better deal. But they are competing with the streaming services. So these user upload platforms are in competition with a Spotify and Apple Music or Deezer. But they exploit the safe harbor to get much better terms, and in particular on things like minimum guarantees, where a Spotify and an Apple provides a minimum guarantee to the rights owners, in the main, YouTube doesn't. And this creates what the music industry has termed the value gap, which we'll talk more about in a moment when I get my guests up. And so the argument from the music industry is that the safe harbor should be restricted, whether that's through a change in law or a clarification of the law, so that certain kinds of user upload platforms no longer have protection, and therefore, if they want content, they have to do a deal, and they have to negotiate deals just like the streaming services do. The reason why this is newsworthy at the moment is that in Europe, there's a copyright directive, a draft copyright directive going through the motions, which we're about to talk about in more detail, and Article 13 of that directive deals with the safe harbor, and this is it. You can have a very quick read of that. It's European law. It's waffly. It doesn't say a great deal about anything. That's law, OK? But this is the article. Now, this is the draft article. This was published last year. This is not the final article. And one of the reasons why Value Gap has been back in the news in the last couple of weeks is we're now getting to the stage of amending this. And we'll talk more about that with the panel. Um, so there you go. That is the very quick beginner's guide to safe harbor and why the music industry has a problem with safe harbor and the European Copyright Directive's attempt to address this issue. You can download the slides at that URL uh, at uh, cmuinsights.com slash medem2017. I'm now going to ask my panelists to join me on stage to delve into this in more detail. So if they want to come from uh, backstage and take their seats. Oh, where have my panelists gone? So <laughs> we're going to have Annabella from the Music Managers Forum in the UK. We've got Gertz from BMG in Germany. We've got uh, Laurie from the International Federation of the Phonographic Industry, so representing the record industry worldwide. And then we have Burak from GSAC, which brings together many of the uh, collecting societies, performing rights organizations that represent the rights of songwriters and publishers across Europe. Um, so those are my guests. I'm going to now walk to that chair there, and as I'm doing that, I'm going to get each of them in turn to quickly introduce themselves and just explain in a sentence what they do and the organisation they represent, and we'll start with Annabella. So, yeah, I'm Annabella, Chief Executive of the Music Managers Forum in the UK. We have about 520 members who are managers of artists, songwriters and producers. And whilst they're based in the UK, many of them, of course, have global businesses. So are very interested in the entire global regulation of copyright. My name is Götz von Einem. I'm working for BMG. We are publishing and a record label. And um, I'm doing, I'm from the Business and Legal Affairs Department, but I'm doing digital licensing, industry affairs, society relations, all these interesting parts. Uh, I'm Lauri Reckhardt. I'm responsible for legal policy and licensing at IFPI, which, as Chris said, represents the recording industry worldwide. Um, I think that's about it. Um, my name is Burak Özgen. I'm from JESAC. JESAC is the uh, grouping of a collective management organizations for artists and composers, and then we have 32 members from 27 countries. As such, more than one million authors and composers, plus the music publishers members of Chesak are represented. So I'm the legal advisor there, mainly dealing with the European policy making. Okay, so I've got a whole bunch of questions. I want to talk, get a little bit more to embellish on what I've just said, the sort of beginner's guide to the Safe Harbor Value Gap and the Value Gap campaign. There may be a little crossover of yesterday's conversation there, but we'll do that quite quickly. I then want to delve into this Article 13 and where we're at in terms of having that amended and whether or not it will work. Um, and then, obviously, this panel is all music industry representatives, as was yesterday's. I imagine most people in the room are music industry representatives. Um, so everyone, there's going to be quite a lot of agreement on this panel. Not complete agreement, I hope, okay, but, but a lot of agreement. So I'm going to play devil's advocate, and I'm going to uh, put on a hat halfway through and be YouTube for five minutes, 
and then I'm going to put a hat on and be a uh, organisation that's talking for uh, libraries and universities and put their arguments to this panel and get their responses. Um, so I mean, let, let's start with with Laurie here, and and um, the IFPI has been very vocal about this for. I would say two to three years now. I remember being at the press briefing in London the first time it was really put forward as being the, the, the priority lobbying issue for, for the organization. I remember there being lots of journalists in the room who don't necessarily write about the music business full time. They write for The Guardian, The FT, The Telegraph, The Broadsheets in the UK. And they were all really confused because they were saying, well, you license YouTube, you work with YouTube, why are you telling us YouTube's the problem? But I suppose, just give us a few figures, this, this, this idea of the value gap that's become a, a big talking point in the last couple of years. What, what do we mean by that, and, and what are the figures to, to, to between what YouTube is generating versus what everyone else is generating? Um, well, actually, first, Chris, let me just commend you on the great presentation. I think it was more than a beginner's guide. It was a really, really good presentation of the issue. Um, why, why it is an issue? I mean, I think, I think you know, we... The, frankly, the value gap is, is so wide, if you will, that whichever way you slice and dice the data, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the, the end result is the same. But, but you know, as, as IFPI, uh, we, we very often we, we use and we look at three key sort of key pieces of, of stats. Um, if you look at the sort of, and, and it really comes back to the sort of the discrepancy between consumption and revenue and the value that, you know, some platforms derive out of the use of, of, of music content in general and what they pay to write on us. It's the, you know, the unfairness in, in, in that. But, but if you just look at sort of, you know, categories of services, um, what we have, you know, streaming services, licensed streaming services, Spotify, these are Apple, with 120 million subscribers, you know, free and, uh, and, and, and paid together. And they together, they pay some 3.9 billion US dollars. So 120, 3.9 billion. And then we have the user upload content platforms, which you know, have combined, we estimate, 900 million users that actually use those platforms to access music. And those services combined pay to, to record labels 550 million US dollars. So there's a huge difference between, between you know, what, what these type of services pay. And services level, uh, if you look at revenue per user, which obviously I think is the most sort of uh, relevant metrics here is uh, we have Spotify, which we estimate pays roughly $20, $20 uh, per user. I suppose to clarify, so that's if you average the free users e exactly. it's with the premium Absolutely. users yeah, across it. the board, each yeah. user's yeah. bringing about yeah. $20. So, so but anyway, so $20, $20, and then we have you know, YouTube, which roughly we estimate pays roughly, as said, less than $1. So one to 20, again. You know, it, it, that's, that's not normal. And then to just look at the, you know, the worst part, almost, of the story is that what we are seeing is that, you know, this gap doesn't seem to be, you know, getting smaller. On the contrary, it you know, seems to get wider and wider. 2015, for the UK, uh, we saw the number of video streams, which is mainly, mainly YouTube, increasing by 88%. So volume increased by 88%, whereas the payments to the labels in the UK grew by 0.4%. Yeah, so, so usage almost doubled, income almost flat. That's it. Um, so, so I suppose those are the, 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 the figures that, that um, have been pushed forward to sort of uh, communicate this value gap. When we're talking about a gap in value, it's the value per user. And so we have a service over here who has more users, more consumption, paying a lot less money than a platform over here that has less users, less consumption. Um, and obviously, the, the, the music industry at large is campaigning on this on a number of levels. In the US, there is actually a review of safe harbor rules that may or may not come to something. But most of the tension has been here in Europe with the European Copyright Directive. And I suppose, let's come to Barack next to sort of get an update on where that's at. So that directive that I put up on the screen, that I'm sure you all read from beginning to end in the 38 seconds I gave you, um, that was published last September, I think. Um, we may have some experts in European law in the room, but let's assume not. So just talk us through where we're at now and, and what the process is. Well, yeah, just in a nutshell. So the, since the proposal in September, uh, now the, there are three institutions in the EU, Commission proposes law, and then the European Parliament representing the people and the member states. 
represented in the council are looking at the text. So they all need to have a say on the text and a version of their text. And then in the end, three of them needs to negotiate to actually uh, find out the final text. So where we are right now is in the parliament, all the committees, all the MEPs that they have put all their amendments on the table. And there's a lot. Yeah, and then I think when you look at them in total for the entire directive, there is more than 2,500 amendments. So, and even on the, one, the legal affairs committee, there are 175 amendments only on this value gap transfer of value issue. So it's a very, very uh, debated issue. And some of those amendments were voted this morning in one of the important committees. The result was not very good, but there are still quite a lot to do on that one. Uh, the final vote, one of the votes, one of the key votes in the parliament is planned to take place end of September, but it's still not the end. And the member states are, have just started to look at that. They are planning with the first version of their talks also towards the end of September, which is far from being the final thing. So yeah, I suppose so the, the uh, European law lecture number one is there are two, <laughs> two sides that need to amend and approve this, which is the European Parliament that everybody here elects, I mean, yeah. assuming you're European. Um, Alexa MPs too, and then the, the EU Council, which basically is each of the member states also yeah. then contributing. So, yeah, but when you look at those things, uh, when you look at the amendments, for instance, so the, there's a huge, um, huge number of amendments that are trying to strengthen and are making clearer and much stronger these existing proposals of the Commission for the interest of the creative community. And then on the other hand, they're completely opposing proposals coming from other sectors, less, but they are represented by the people who kind of a little bit, that kind of really hijacked the process a little bit. But from the very beginning, they took the position to write the report. So the people who write the report have a negative view, but the rest of the parliament is more positive. So it creates a lot of difficulty in terms of lawmaking. You need to work with the other people against the people who write that. So it's a little bit yeah, so there are arguments on both sides and therefore amendments on both sides in terms of strengthening the article we just looked yeah. at and weakening the article that we just looked at. One proposal was to delete the article that we just looked at. Um, on the panel today, we sort of have different elements of the music industry represented. Um, it, uh, you, some of you have multiple hats, but I suppose we've got songwriters represented, labels, publishers, and, and managers. And I suppose it is interesting that this is one of the few issues that does seem to have united the various different strands to an extent. So I suppose let's, let's get Gortz and Annabella just give their perspective, you know, as, as one of the um, big music rights companies in Europe, um, is, is how important an issue is it for you and what is your take on, on what is happening in, in the EU at the moment? Well, it certainly is a big issue because uh, everyone keeps talking about it. Um, <laughs> the thing is, it's, on the one hand, uh, we have the legal process in Brussels or the legislative process in Brussels. Um, and on the other hand, we have the day-to-day -day business with uh, companies like YouTube or SoundCloud because, I mean, it's our nature, it's in our DNA as a publisher or as a label to license every day, and we cannot wait until <laughs> laws changes. So, H Hence, I suppose, that thing I said at the start, that, that I, I, the journalists from the FT, the Telegraph, the Guardian, were really confused of saying, you're telling us this is the biggest problem, and yet you're working with these companies we don't understand. Well, I think you gave some explanation yeah. in your introduction. Um, and I should also, which is, to, just to repeat, is that, um, again, there is a big platform, there's a big, uh, huge music consumption there, and, uh, of course, we need to make sure that our clients, which are the artists and the writers, can benefit from them. Because, I mean, you know this as well, it's just, um, artists and writers sometimes have a very short period in which they can make career, make money, and they cannot wait until everything is being solved. So, yes, I agree, they, we need to take a pragmatic approach sometimes, but I also think it's worth it because we can see, um, and I'm not saying this to opposition to this, I just think the things which run in parallel, which is really trying to work with them, trying to convince them that uh, they as a service, if they want to be a friend of the music company and of the artists and writers, 
they need to move as well. And we see that at certain extents, but uh, it certainly helps if there comes some push from Brussels as well. That's okay. And I suppose, Annabella, get, get a, a perspective from the, from the management community and, I suppose, the artists and songwriters that those managers represent. Yeah, so I, I think we share a, a really similar perspective in that, obviously, managers and the artists and songwriters would like to see more money flowing through the chain. They also recognise the value of working with companies like YouTube for their recorded income, their songwriting income, but also in terms of their wider artist strategy, which is obviously building your fan base and helping bring people to the other income streams that artists see, including live merchandising and so on. I mean, our, 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 I think our perspective on this whole debate has been, yes, there's the value gap, but we mustn't forget the value chain. When we talk about the value chain, we talk from audience all the way through to artists, which obviously includes services like YouTube, but also Spotify, Apple, and others, the labels, collecting societies, and publishers, and ensuring that money is actually coming back to the artists. And so for us, our, our main focus actually has been on some other linked parts of the directive that we see as a package um, that look at ensuring that there is transparency. So at the moment, and it's something I know we've talked a lot about, there are many NDAs. So, you know, great, get more money from... Uh, from the DSPs, from the YouTubes of this world and, and get them into to the labels and publishers, but then we want the guarantee that that money will be shared fairly and transparently back with those who create the music in the first place. So the European Commission has recognised this as an issue and has put some wording into the directive around the beneficiaries of copyright being able to have uh, transparency around that money and how it flows. The other article they've looked at is where indeed you're on what we would term unfair contracts, which may be pre-digital contracts, it may be that you were signed in the 70s, 80s or 90s, way before streaming existed, in fact downloads were maybe only just starting, um, and you're on a contract where there were things like packaging deductions and TV advertising deductions and all kinds of uh, ways of which may have been suitable, and I think we challenge some of those for a physical world, we would like to have the ability to ensure that those are are not part of a digital world. So as we fight the battle to close a gap, actually we're fighting a va battle to ensure the money comes all the way through the chain to songwriters, but also to performers and the featured artists and those who are performing the music. And if you go to the copyright directive, I showed you Article 13 and Article 14 and 15 are dealing with those issues. So, so they, as you say, in essence, a little package of music-specific articles. Um, I said I was sort of going to present the devil's advocate arguments from the other side, so I'm quickly going to do that um, now. So I suppose YouTube would give various arguments. They don't generally come to conferences like this anymore, do they? But um, they, 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 I suppose you touched on the fact that in addition to revenue from YouTube, it is a great marketing channel, particularly for new artists, for artists who are at the start of their career trying to build their following. And I think one thing that YouTube sometimes says is, well, there are different sorts of services, aren't there? So if we think of the olden days, if we think of the, the pre-digital age, Actually, most people consumed most of their music for free through radio that played nominal royalties into the music industry. And in the US, on the recording side, no money into the music industry. And then you had CDs. And a small number of people consumed, well, that's not logic. Less people consumed less music through CD, which generated a lot of money. So there are, there are two different kinds of services. So they would say, so we're sort of replacing radio, and Spotify is sort of replacing CD. So we're not competing. And I suppose, as I said at the start, there is an element of, I think, what the labels are saying is, no, but you are competing with Spotify and Apple. And that is part of, of the conversation. Um, Google put out a report as part of this lobbying process a couple of months ago saying, no, 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 we're not. So I suppose, you know, what, what is, I mean, any, any of you are welcome to respond to this. What, what is your take to that argument, which is one of the wings that, that YouTube have, have put forward? I mean, look... Let's be absolutely clear, YouTube is not radio. YouTube is, is, is you know, the single biggest on-demand online music service around. And, uh, and you know, there are lots of data that show that what YouTube, you know, YouTube is directly competing with services like Spotify, Deezer, Apple, you mentioned them. Um, you know, for instance, we, we have sort of consumer surveys that we repeat. Uh, year on year, and they consistently show, for instance, that what 80% of, of YouTube users use YouTube to access music, a smaller process on a weekly or percentage of, on a weekly basis. Um, but anyway, so a, a huge, huge user base. And the other point is, 
people go there not to sort of to discover new music. They go there to listen to music they already know. That's what consumers say. So I think that's you know beyond doubt. And and obviously you look at radio. What you know radio doesn't provide the same functionalities as you do. So. With all due respect, uh, I would disagree, and I think you know the, the industry disagrees. Um, and obviously, then you know if you if you look at you know radio as a as a sort of you know promotional tool, fine, you can debate that. But but you know the, the other, I think the more important point is that it should be up to the right owners to decide how to promote their music. It can't be that one service says, "Look, I'm going to promote you, and you should be really happy." You know, fine, but let's you know let's determine the rules together. You know, then that's not what's, what's happening today. Yeah, let's come to get, get, get your response on it. And, and I suppose also there is an element, speaking from a songwriter perspective, I know that song, particularly songwriters who predominantly write for other people find the, but think of the promotion argument, the most annoying thing in the world. Absolutely, that's exactly <laughs> the point that I was planning to make. And uh, One of these things is like promotion and then direct to fan relation that the platform is providing. For songwriters and for composers that most of them are writing for on commission or like for background music, media authors. They don't really have the fan relation. Their relation is directly with the people that they're licensing. So it's like, in that sense, it's not a uh, valid point. And after all, I find it quite strange, actually, because how come in the cultural sector, promotion is an argument for not paying? Is there any part of the value chain which does not promote each other when using each other's work. A concert place on a venue, venue promotes artists, artists promotes venue. You use a music on a product, each of them are promoting each other, but you're still paying. You are on TV, you are promoting yourself, but it's also promoting the TV. So it's, I, it's in the nature of the cultural industry that everything is promoting each other. It's another part of the value chain, it's another exploitation that you need to use. And how come that could now be an excuse not to pay anything? So that's really not acceptable. The, the other argument that's been put forward by various organizations who may or may not be funded by uh, the big user upload platforms, but I mean, certainly they have got the support of, for example, universities and libraries or, or digital rights organizations is sort of unintended consequences argument of, of will we stop startups coming to market? I think actually we can all agree that it's not in the music community's interest to end up with a digital music market, which certainly in Europe has two and a half to three services. So we want more services to come to market. Some of the issues that have been raised, well, free speech is always raised in this. It's censorship. Um, uh, and also, I suppose, fair use, fair dealing is, is also raised of, of will, will it, you know, there are certain scenarios where actually it is fine for people to make use of this content. Will putting these blocks in stop that? So I suppose with those other arguments, there was an open letter last week put forward by various organisations to this effect. What's your comeback when people are saying that? As anyone can answer that. Uh, sorry. I actually think that's a strange argument because I think the, the idea of the we are proposing is that there is a level playing field between the services and that everyone knows the rules and that just not one or two or three services take advantage of rules which have not been designed for their business um, so that they get on a level where they're actually competing with others and not finding ways around that. And that should also help startups to know the framework that they're operating in. And they don't have to compete with someone like YouTube, which is maybe not comparable. If they qualify for the safe harbor provisions, that's absolutely fine. As you said in the beginning, they have a, there's a reason for that, but it was not intended to uh, support a full streaming service. Oh, do you want to come in on that? Or? Yeah, well, the yeah. answer to that is many, because first of all, it's not true that it would block startups, because we've already seen several companies in the field that will provide services for the compliance with the requirement of the law, which are offered on a really affordable prices. And it's not really the case that every single startup needs to develop its own content ID technology, spend money for that one, and then go in the market. So they can use third-party solution providers. And then they, those companies can be a kind of standard, and then everybody agrees. Like, okay, so this company ensures the compliance, and then you can deal with that. And it's accessible. 
And the other thing is, I mean, why uh, the EU law or the policy should create an environment where startups growing based on actually destroying another type of business. I mean, they should, as any startup, comply with the laws that ensure competition, that ensure other people's rights, that ensure taxation or all the other things. So why we need to create an environment where they grow on an illegal basis or like in an unfair competition with other types of services? Okay. Don't yeah, I, I, in fact, I, I think I've probably got a question for you guys. Um, so in the post future gazing, in the post safe harbor world, do you still see there'll be uh, a view or a place for advertising funded services? Yes, yeah, so so Spotify so has got its advertising funded services. So if we services. make the assumption, which, which we will then deconstruct in a moment, but if we make the assumption that actually this works and we manage to, to, to force a company like YouTube into, into the, the kind of deals that you want, I suppose what you're saying is, what deals do you want? Is, is it that you're saying we don't like the ad funded free services or, or, or what is it? Yeah, I mean, will we end up with everything being on subscription? I guess, from many of my members' perspective, I was going to say they do see some value in having that kind of ad-funded, not necessarily the way it currently operates, but they do see the value in, in the engagement, which doesn't work for all artists, but does work for some... And artists. especially newer artists who are trying to build yeah, an audience. Yeah, occasionally some heritage artists who've got an awful lot of material, I think, but there are some artists it, it doesn't work for at all. It will depend very much on genre. But I'm just really intrigued. Are we going to end up where everything is a £10 a month subscription, or are we going to end up with just more money being paid for the kind of ad-funded services in some way? Yeah, I mean, look, if I may, I, and a very good question, and I think we need to be absolutely clear about this. Um, you know, the value campaign, if you want to call it that, it, it is not a campaign against, you know, any sing, single individual business model or any, any business, frankly. You know, fine, we discussed about YouTube because it just happens to be the largest UUC platform. Um, but it's not about YouTube. I mean, as you said, you know, there are ways and in the future um, everybody would be happy to work with YouTube. Of course, that's not the point. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so, but, the, but, but your, your question, no. I'm, I'm sure there is, you know, there is a space and time for also for ad funded. It's all about the freedom to sort of negotiate the commercial terms of your relationship with with the platforms. This is what we are trying to achieve. It is not to, to say you can't have one business model. But I suppose YouTube is ultimately on a revenue share basis, as indeed are all the streaming services. At the core of most of the streaming deals, with perhaps the exception of some of the compulsory license ones, like in the US, but, but most of the streaming deals, they are ultimately revenue share arrangements with some other complications thrown in. So I suppose YouTube might say, well, we have a revenue share arrangement. This is as much revenue as we can generate. Is there an element of saying, well, we, 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 don't, we think you can generate more money. You're not selling enough advertising. Well, this, this comes sort of, you know, to the really the core of the value gap. You know, you, I think, you know, at the heart of the problem is that because of the way they can game the system, right? And they don't, they don't necessarily need to, to generate you know, revenue that in a way that then would then flow back to the right owners. You know, it, it is the, the sort of the market distortion which allows them to get away with that. And that's what we need to you know, deal with. It's, it really is leveling the playing field, as you were saying. Um, a part of the problem is also the transparency on that. I mean, you say that it's a revenue share based on the amount presented to you. You, don't, you are not always sure, actually, whether that is the amount that you should be talking about. Apart from the issue that whether that is the amount that should be created from the exploitation of the work, which is another part. But plus, actually, there is not always a possibility of audit when a service like YouTube that works on a platform of the services of Google, the way that they generate money based on advertising is quite complex. So how much of it is coming from the Google search when it's directed to YouTube or and which part of the advertising is actually counted for the amount that you are actually sharing? I suppose on, on the recording side, the majors either directly or through Vivo are sometimes selling the advertising and then they're sharing. It works the other way around. So I suppose in, in, in that respect, they, they, in terms of do you trust YouTube, when they say, oh yeah, your 55% was a pound, I suppose there is an element of, well, where is the, the information to back that up? The problem is you don't have a choice. That's that kind of the same part 
of the tax. So it's that kind of, I'm offering you this amount of money. I don't want to negotiate anything further. And then this is the data that I'm providing. I don't want to, I suppose, I'm and not that, under that, obligation that, of anything further than that. I suppose that's the really important point. So what you're saying is, is when, when you're negotiating with YouTube because of the safe harbor get out, it's not just about negotiating a better rate. It's about saying, this is how we want to be reported to. This is how we would like. And okay, we sit down around a table and we agree, but the feeling is, because of the safe harbor and the reasons we discussed earlier, beyond revenue share, there's lots of things where ultimately a YouTube or whoever can say, this is how it's working. This is what you're going to get. Be happy with that. Yeah, although that's how many artists feel at the end of the value <laughs> chain, that they, they don't have the transparency and they're told, this is how we report to you and you've got no choice about it. So I think there's a bit of irony here in some cases about having that argument. I, th I think it's a legitimate argument to have with DSPs of all forms, but then I think it absolutely must, those provisions must also be accessible to artists and songwriters. Yeah, so the transpar there are transfer issues at every single stage yeah. in the value chain from an artist's perspective. Um, so... We've made an assumption there that this is going to work and what, what's the future world. I suppose let's just quickly uh, dig. I mean, I'm going to come to you guys for some questions later, so if you have questions, do, do think them. But I just want to sort of go back to the Article 13 as it's currently written. And I suppose as, as a journalist who reports on this, when that came out uh, last September, I read that, and my immediate response to that is, if this, if, if this is the final directive, now obviously we don't know what the final directive is going to be, but if this is the final Article 13... I suspect the day this is passed by Council and Parliament in Europe, the next day I will get a press release from YouTube which will say, we're already compliant with this. Um, and so the world can just carry on regardless. So, so, so do you think that the article as currently written w would provide the, the clarity, the framework through which you could get that stronger negotiating hand? Well, yeah. Uh, well, I mean... There is this Article 13, one thing, which is actually mainly about the technical cooperation for identification of the works, either for licensing or for removing if you cannot agree on a thing. So this is an obligation to cooperate on a technical level, and that's only one part of it, when you actually have the deal or when you get there. But there are some explanatory preamble part of the directive that are called recitals. There, the proposal actually provides that first, say, these companies, when they store and give access to public through their indispensable role, they are undertaking an act of copyright. And then it says that in the second paragraph, if they are really active in doing that by promoting the content or optimizing the presentation of it, they cannot claim safe harbor regime. So this is exactly the two legal problems that we've been facing in every single court across the Europe. The courts say that either there is no communication to the public, or they say even if there is, they, they, are, they are covered by the safe harbor. So some of them are just are refusing the cases, some of them are looking at them, giving completely contradictory decisions across Europe and then making the issue really, really stuck as it is, because I mean, each case takes nine years without any certain outcome, and then everywhere they decide on a different way. So with this clarification of the current law as it exists, to say that what they do is an act of copyright for which they need to get a license, and then if their role is this way, like by promoting and optimizing it, is going beyond the passive uh, intermediary status, then they're under the obligation. So that clears. Then we can go to all the courts who said like the different... So I suppose, just to clarify two points there. So the, the directive, if you download it, um, the, the actual directive is quite short and it's at the back of the document. And at the front of the document, there are pages and pages and pages and pages of stuff, mainly about newspaper and uh, new copyrights and blah, blah, blah. But then there is some stuff in there about all of this. And so you're saying that in there, there are, there are two very important paragraphs, which are as or if not more important than the article itself. Um, and I suppose the other thing that, that you're sort of referring to there is I often say, oh, the music industry wants to rewrite copyright law, wants to rewrite the safe harbor. But I sense that you would almost argue, actually, you're looking for a clarification of what the law already is. You don't want the law changed. You want clarification that your view of how the law was written back in the 90s is the right one. Yeah. Or, or you know, I think we can go even further. You know, 
it's not that we don't want, we don't, you know, proper construction, we don't need it. You know, this is what they already said, you know, or law, the European law already says. What we need is the sort of the, the national courts and, you know, what have you used to apply the court as the, the law as it was intended to be applied when it was, was enacted in, you know, the Copyright Direct in 2001 and, and the E-Commerce Direct in 2000. So the, I suppose that, that's an interesting point that there have been there have been various cases in courts around Europe, and indeed we have some big cases in the US. I think the, the MTV Viacom YouTube case was probably the biggest. There have been various cases in the US and in Europe testing, because actually if you go back to the original safe harbor, as of all law, it's a little bit abstract. <laughs> it certainly doesn't talk about user upload platforms. So it has been tested in court, but I, I sort of sense it hasn't been universally against the music industry, but I think there's been a number of judgments that the music industry has been disappointed with. Um, so, so are you saying that even if the article goes through either in its current form or maybe even a weaker form, if, if the other side wins the lobbying, that, you, that those two paragraphs that aren't actually part of the directive, but they could be used in court if, if, uh, if another case was pursued somewhere in Europe? They are part of the directive. They are just part of the operative articles. They are yeah. the recitals, and, and they have different effect, but they are part of the directive. So, you know, get clear about that. But, but yes, you know, we, we do believe that if they go through as, as the commission proposed, uh, then, you know, it would be helpful. Whether the effect is sort of, you know, flick a switch, and the next day, you know, everything is, is fine and dandy, no. but then you know, going forward, it will affect the marketplace and create the, the environment, the sort of the fair, fair environment where right owners can, can negotiate fair deals. Do you, if, if the article goes through more or less as it's currently written and those two extra paragraphs up, up the top are there, um, you're being positive about what you think you can do with that, but d will it ultimately require some landmark judgments in court, or will it be enough to simply put pressure on, on the partners that actually the music industry is working with w when New Deal negotiations come up? I think, quite honestly, I think it will be another argument that we can make and say, you see, you've been relying on this, and you've been, all these years you've made these arguments, but you see, um, that wasn't the intention. Now, let's talk seriously and try to make a deal that is um, more beneficial for our clients than it's at the moment. Um, and I think we shouldn't also forget it's one is the commercial impact of Safe Harbor. There are other consequences as well. One is, I think I already mentioned it, a lot of effort that we need to put into in actually identifying our repertoire. And for example, I truly hope that there will be some change uh, in that respect, that it makes it easier for us to identify our repertoire, because at the moment, as you just said, we, we cannot be certain which clicks are actually being remunerated and, or monetized, let's put it that way, and then actually remunerated. And um, on top of that, we need to make sure that every day uh, our repertoire is actually claimed. And that's absolutely the, I mean, that's the starting point for us being able to pass on that information to our clients, which we absolutely want to do. And, uh, but at the moment, quite honestly, I find it hard over and over again to explain to our clients why their stream is just worth that little compared to others. Um, because I cannot, I cannot make up the math myself. I just take the money. <laughs> and it's not only because of NDAs or so, it's just because the system doesn't allow me to reconcile where the money comes from. And, and that's what I want to work on. And I suppose if, if we start with YouTube, that would be the one argument YouTube might put forward that I didn't put forward previously when I had my YouTube hat on, which is, hey, Content ID is brilliant. We spent however much they claim to have spent on building this system to identify tracks over here and songs over here. It's a great system. It means that it isn't onerous for you to have to manage your content on our platform. And I suppose, again, there's, there's a thing there that I think most of the managers certainly I talk to, and indeed most of the labels and publishers I talk labels maybe more so than publishers, say it is a really good system, but it's, it's still not good enough. It's absolutely not good enough, and I'm saying this especially from a publisher's perspective, because the complexity we have on the publishing side with our co-writings is really, 
it doesn't isn't properly reflected in the system. Which as, as I said, I'm just, I mean, I, I'm probably stating the obvious here, but just to clarify, that's because technically it's a lot harder to recognize a composition that could be played in a multitude of different ways than it is a recording which, providing someone doesn't sneakily slow it down a bit, should always play in, in the same fashion. Well, the simple example is that every cat video um, or with someone playing a cover version, uh, a cover version is a better example, actually affects the copyright maybe not the sound recording immediately. So, and we need to identify that. And uh, so that's a lot of work we put on this. I mean, there's a whole industry living from this, providing services to identify and work with content ID. Still, I would say it's probably the best system that's in the market at the moment, um, but that's not good enough. Yeah, can I, just, I mean, from the label side, I, I think you're absolutely right. I'm sure that the technology is pretty good. I mean, after all, these guys can, you know, put driverless cars on roads, so, you know, <laughs> shouldn't be a problem, really. Uh, the issue is more the rules, the, you know, the business rules, the application of the technology, so how it's been applied. And that's where something like Article 13, you know, should help, because actually it's no longer something that you put out there voluntarily. You, there's a legal obligation, you need to have this, if you will, you know, reason, a reasonable duty of care. Apply technologies that you can, and, uh, and, and they have to be applied in an effective manner. So that's, I think, is, you know, would be the added value of Article 13, yeah, so from also with respect to YouTube. F from a YouTube perspective, there would be a legal as well as commercial incentive to, to do everything you can to make that the absolute best case scenario. Of course, I haven't mentioned the other elephant in the room, which is Facebook, but I'm going to take questions from the floor and then maybe we'll ask that um, in the latter part. Are there any questions in the room? I can just about see you. Look at that. Maybe we'll go straight on to Facebook. No, nope, can't see any questions. <laughs> well, in which case, um, I mean, we, we do tend to talk about this a lot in terms of YouTube, certainly I do as a journalist, it's, it's sort of, it's, it, because it is by far the biggest, certainly from a North American, European perspective. Um, but there are other services. Um, uh, I suppose the other big two that used to be mentioned were SoundCloud, although SoundCloud has now done the deals, and as far as I can see, is, is now a friend, although I'm yet to meet anybody who's actually earned any royalties from those deals, but there are deals on the table. Um, the... Um, Daily Motion, of course, was a bad guy. Then it got bought by Vivendi, and that was weird for two years. And now Daily Motion's reinventing itself, so perhaps it, it, it will change. Um, but Facebook, obviously, is becoming a video platform. Uh, it, actually, it has no licenses. It does have a system called Rights Manager. My understanding is it's nowhere near as good as Content ID yet. I don't know. Um, but, I mean, do, do you see Facebook as being another safe harbor dweller, as I call them? And, and do you think there's going to be exactly the same challenges with Facebook as we've had with YouTube, given they've just hired all of uh, YouTube's ex-staff to do their deals? Nice comment at the end. Um, <laughs> I, I, think, I think there's a difference between Facebook and YouTube when it comes to the service. Um, still, I think, at least openly, they rely on the same regulations. That's correct. And I think you need to look at both servers separately if, because what Facebook is doing at the moment is they providing the platform, they let users upload the videos, and yet they are not as, they are not creating as much as YouTube. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And, and this is a thin line. So. Uh, a th thin line, yes, and, but, but you're absolutely right. The services are different, and there are meaningful differences. And I suppose, just to clarify that point, going back to what we were saying earlier, I suppose, w w as it currently stands, obviously Facebook service is rapidly evolving, but I suppose, are we sort of saying at the moment, we think there are consumers out there who have YouTube playlists, and as a result of that, they'll say, don't need Spotify, don't need Apple Music, I've got YouTube, whereas no one is currently saying, oh, I listen to all my music on Facebook. Cor cor correct, and... and I think it's fair to say that maybe the attitude is slightly different to you know, working with the right owners. But, uh... but on a point of principle, they should still be paying. Yeah. <laughs> and it's going to be fascinating, because at the moment, most of us end up paying Facebook to reach our fans, whereas at least with YouTube, we get some money, if not very much, for, for reaching our fans. So that will be potentially transformed majorly if it ends up becoming a, a proper revenue source of some form. In terms of the um, ongoing campaign in Brussels, I mean, I suppose you mentioned that we are expecting the parliament to have a, some sort of decision by September. Um, do we know how long it will probably take to get through 
council? Well, these things are really, you cannot predict. Uh, it could be quick, but it seems it's going to take time. But I think it's an important period for the mobilization for the creators. So, and because we did once before the European Commission come, came up with the proposals. So they were having doubts about whether we should address this issue or not. And then we started a campaign which ended up with uh, 22,000 signatures of the creators from all sectors. And then that was given to the president of the commission and then to us, that you need to do something on that. So it worked quite well. We got a good proposal. So now we are seeing, again, doubts about addressing this issue or not at the EU level in the parliament and at the member states level. So that's why at JSAC we started a new campaign. So this was a week ago? Yes, yes, that was a week ago. We had a big major event in Brussels called Meet the Authors, and many policymakers and authors came. So the letter was launched there with the 75 creators there who signed it. And then it's already more than 3,500 signatures right now. It's on the internet for the creators here. Please go and sign it as well if you think it's a good idea. So it's a very simple message around less than a page, starting with Dear European Union, address this issue. Sincerely, creators. So it's the kind of very straightforward, really trying to say the member states and the... Uh, with that songwriter constituency, I mean, Annabella mentioned earlier very much the artists that we talk to see the free articles as very much a package, yeah. and they are, they are, they are, they are. Yes, they're very supportive of Safe Harbour, but also on the transparency and the, and the contract adjustment. Now, I mean, that's definitely true on the artist side. Is is that also an issue on the songwriter side? Are songwriters seeing all of those articles as being equally important? Uh, that that's another issue than this, of course. And uh, from the author society's point of view, we have a very clear position on that one. I think nobody can argue that transparency is a bad thing. We all love transparency. We just had a new law two years ago for the transparency on the like copyright the on the collecting society side. So we are subject to that. We are not concerned by those things, but transparency. Why not? For the rest. Author societies have been founded by the authors for certain purposes to negotiate collectively anyway, so we are there to do that, mm. and then we are happy to do that. So. Well, we would argue all those things come absolutely intrinsically together, mm. and so just talking about one element of the copyright package, they can't be separated out. In fact, they, they shouldn't be separated out. They should stand together, and we would love to have the support of the collecting societies, the labels, and the publishers for not just addressing the issue of the gap, but addressing the issue of fairness throughout the entire chain. So not transparency for transparency's sake, but transparency so you know how the money is flowing, and is it flowing correctly, and more importantly, is it flowing fairly in a digital age? And that's where the other elements of the package, we would argue, should all come together. And so when we campaign, we should campaign on, on everything. I'll go on very quickly, and then I'm going to say one last thing in our remaining minute. I just want to say, you're absolutely right, it's not only transparency. Transparency doesn't help if it's not fair. And whether, how we can achieve that, that's a tricky question. Can I just, you know, add the obvious, you know, transparency is, you know, great thing, but it doesn't help if you can't grow the pie. So, you know, that's really, as an industry, and across cultural industries, we need to focus. And, and that is, you know, you've started by saying that it is, you know, probably the first you know campaign in a long time where the music sector is you know really is, speaking is as one speaking as one and it actually goes beyond you know it's not only the music industry it's you know cultural sectors you know many different writers whatever are are you know speaking as as the cultural industries in europe and that's a that re to me personally is just, it's great to see our time is up. Um, we've had a European focus today, A, because that's where the most developments are happening, and B, we're sitting in Europe. Um, there are developments in the US. Uh, we're still waiting for the Copyright Office there to feed back on their review. So all I can suggest is that you go to cmusignup.com and sign up to my CMU Daily Bulletin and podcast, and I will keep you up to date on what's happening in the US. Meanwhile, myself and Annabella, as the British people on the stage, are now going to go backstage and work out what the hell Brexit means for all of this. And we might get all of this in the EU, and then our mad government yet. TBC will then uh, overrule it all. But uh, we're not going to talk about Brexit here today. Um, so I think a really interesting conversation, and it will be interesting to see in a year's time, because there are some big deadlines between now and, and Medem in a year's time, whether there have been any big developments in the 12 months to come. So keep an eye on that. And please, can I have a round of applause for my panel? Thank you. Thank you.